We can't hear you. How about now? Great. Great. <clears throat> Suppose you have a choice to make. Which car to buy? What color to paint your living room? whether you should go out on a date with so-and-so or not, or how to balance your personal budget. And let's say it's not an easy decision. It becomes a hard decision. What goes on inside of you when you have to make a hard decision? Remember a time or what it's like to have your whole mind screwed up and you're not knowing what to do. You write down all the points and go through them one by one or do you struggle with them in your head, so to speak? And what happens to you at that point? Do you know who you are at that point? Are you your body at that point? Or are your mind all twisted and scrambling for answers? In that moment of confusion and of stress, are you your body? I don't think so. You're all mental at that state. To forget about your body and your mind focuses on the problem, which is some problem in the external world that you have to solve. You feel the tension, mostly in your head. But ideas sweep through your head as you choose one alternative after another and see how it feels. But you're not checking your body for feelings. You're checking for your mind, whether it's still tight and scrambled, full of tension, or whether the decision is made and it relaxes. But here you can become absolutely sure your identity is not with the body, but with your mind and the tension in the mind and the thoughts around that that are clashing. Here, you become absolutely certain if you're asked the inquiry at that moment that you're not your body, you're your mind, consciousness.
I'm asking you to realize that you as a human being are living out of your consciousness. Sure, the body is there and you think about it all the time. How healthy it is, what it wants to eat, when it wants to sleep. But are you that body? I gave you one instance in the time of making a tough decision that you absolutely realize you're not your body, but all of your attention is on your mind and the decision. Now, during the day, maybe like me, when you relax, random thoughts come into your mind and you may follow them or not. Random feelings can come to your body like hunger or feeling your breathing or feeling the pressure of furniture against your body your feet, but taken in isolation, is that pressure against your body you, or just something you observe? Do you just observe your body? and the comings and goings of various feelings inside of the body? Or are you more surely emotions that go through you when external circumstances change and you have an emotional reaction to it? Which seems more real to you? the passing issues of the felt sense of your body or the emotional issues that strike you when you see something you like or don't like. For example, your wife or girlfriend spending a lot of time with another guy Do you feel jealous? What do you feel, if anything? Do you feel possessive? Are you indifferent? Do you see how important your feelings are to you? So how can you say you're a body? The emotional reactions you have, like jealousy or anger, sorrow, bitterness. These emotions are not your body. They may manifest through the body but your experience of them is in a different realm from that of your experience of your body. You recognize jealousy and that does have a bodily sensation. 
how your body reacts, but it's primarily it's emotional reaction. But do you deny that that emotion is you, part of you? I just want you to be aware of how much you are. It's not related to what you are as a body. But it's a function of your concepts. She belongs to me. No one else should be in there. Just me. Or I fear losing my job and I think about it all the time. What will I do if I lose my job? How will I pay the mortgage or the rent? All day long, such as this, we think, we worry. Most of our time is spent not watching or feeling the body, but dealing with mental issues and concepts and worries and desires, which have little to do with the body, our bodies. Most of the time, we're involved with fantasy processes, which create entertainment possibilities for us. I sit and watch movies on television. Does it do my body any good? Or is it just for entertainment? Why is it that you come here? Is it to suit your body? Or to give you some relief from life? or perhaps some sort of realization. What is realization like? You see, you can spend 30 years searching for self-realization and really not be much aware of your body at all. It just does its thing every day whether it's as a bookkeeper an athlete an office worker student we live our life in concepts not our bodies not a lot of people are really aware of their bodies they don't take the time to stop the thinking, stop the running, running after desires, stop the entertainment. How many people watch YouTube videos during the day to while away the time when instead You could be relaxing and feeling your body. But for many of us, that sounds too boring. There's not enough entertainment there. Some people like to stop 
watch and feel the energy flows in and around the body. That's Mark. Who is a coherent bundle of nexus energies. Or maybe there's Raghu who says, what the fuck is going on here? Who am I? Who is Ed? Who's Nisar Gadada? What do they know? What do I know? Who is Jay really? Is it the one that listens to my voice and to my words? Or is it the one that's sitting in the chair? A lump of flesh. Or is it the one that's sentient? The one that's aware of my voice aware of his body. Don't you see? We may have a body, but what we are really has little to do with the body. The body is just the support for who we really are, which is ideas, concepts, a person who's lost or knows the way, a person that has experiences and tries to understand these experiences, a person looking for self-realization, a person looking for wisdom, for enlightenment. I'll tell you, that's who we mostly are, is the one that's involved in a quest But what is that that has no quests, has no desires, has no interest in the body or in that around us? Who is that the first thing in the morning? Who is awakening, but is even not even aware of the world yet? That thing there, who's not yet aware of the world and of one's own existence in the world, but is awakening. What is that? What is that? what Nisargadatta calls the birth principle. It contains all things. And when we wake up and we're fully alert, but still we're not aware yet of the world being separate from us and us being in a body in a particular place. That instant before the world appears and I appear, and yet we're awake. That's called the Turiya state. And it contains all of our other states, our thinking mind, our feeling, our awareness of our bodies, our awareness of our world. All of these are added on. And that is primary even to our minds and to our recognition of ourselves as existing. 
That one has no characteristics. No time, no space. Just coming awake before the idea dawns that I'm awakening into the world into, on my bed in New York City or in Peoria or in California or wherever, Washington, Oregon, Mississippi before that knowledge comes to us. We're nothing. We have no characteristics, no qualities, no desires, no birth, no death, no space, no time. In that instant, before the world appears and we realize that we're in the world and that we're awake. I remember when I was 14, my father had just died. That I'd awake in the morning And there was really nothing. I would just wake up. I wasn't aware of anything yet. There's no quality to that state. It's not happy or sad, heavy or light. But then suddenly, and it was a full two seconds or more between the time of first awakening and opening my eyes, or maybe my eyes weren't even open yet. Then I realized I was awakening to a reality where my father is dead. And I suddenly felt kind of horror and a panicky sense of horror. As I became aware that I was alive and awake in a house that no longer had my father in it, and that I had in a sense lost my guardian. But that interval between awakening and feeling the life energy coming out of the gut and slowly going into my brain and expanding there and then coming awake. But at that point of being awake, I'm not awake to who I was or where I was. That took another two seconds. It really, really helps you understand the nature of consciousness and of who and what you are to be able to slow down the awakening process and watch it happen to you. Slow it down. And you do that by repetition of the idea you want to be aware of what the awakening process is. You think about it all the time. You think about it just before you go to bed and you try to remember it. The first thing when you wake up is to watch the awakening process. And eventually, 
you'll catch yourself with that idea of watching the process in the midst of waking up. And this adds a whole new dimension to your sentience, to what you're aware of. I want to watch myself wake up. I want to watch myself becoming conscious in what happens. I want to watch the arising of awareness in me from my gut to my eyes. I want to feel what it's like to transition between sleep and awakening state and watch what happens to the two kinds of consciousness, sleeping consciousness and waking consciousness. And after I wake, wake, what happened to the sleep consciousness? Is it still there to be able to be grasped on someplace? And after a while, you'll be able to move between the two kinds of consciousness back and forth even more easily than to room to move between two rooms. You'll be able to go to sleep instantly and wake up almost instantly and watch the entire process as you go back and forth between sleep and waking consciousness. And you'll see that that waking consciousness comes to you. And you're just an observer of it. You're not the body because the body appears in waking consciousness. It's an object there. And you see it clearly as an object separate from you. Is there anybody here that can do this now that has that capability or has experienced that? This is what to shoot for. It comes from repeated attempts to be aware of yourself and the consciousness in you. You have to turn your life around and look inward rather than outward. Now our natural inclination is to look outward. Our sources of food air, water, protection for our body, housing for our body. But the reality is we are foremost our consciousness or the witness of consciousness. When you change your orientation from being a human being, kind of lost in one's daily life and the vicissitudes of all of the challenges that accompany your daily life and instead Focus entirely on your consciousness, the quality of your consciousness, the clarity of your consciousness. In a way, it's a lot like watching your vision 
and how your vision changes through the day. Sometimes it's very clear and crisp at other times when you feel sleepy. It's not so much that way. It's lazy and relaxed. But how attentive you are in a large means or manner, determine the clarity of your perceptions. If you're highly alert, like after hearing a strange sound that wakes you in the middle of the night, the slightest sound, the slightest bit of new light grabs your attention and is crystal clear. While after watching a movie that was sort of boring, and a few minutes after the movie ended, you may be pretty relaxed. And then that relaxation, everything in your awareness is also relaxed. There's no tension in your body. And if you can do tension, if you can find tension, take that as your object of awareness rather than the television set. Become aware of your inner tension. What part of your body has it settled in? your back, your shoulders, your chest, your stomach. And be aware of that tension. And by being aware of it, devote your entire attention to it. And just like that, you can absorb that tension, melt it, and bring it into your sense of self, which is not the body, but the internal relaxation, which is pure awareness without an object. your body will feel much expanded and relaxed. As its tension leaves, now is that tension the body? Or is it an awareness of the state of the body? with some internal tension somewhere in your gut or chest. What is that tension about? Feel into it. For many hours, look at that tension, feel that tension. That's all you do. Instead of reading a book or watching a movie, you feel that tension within you. Have your consciousness go to, or your awareness directed towards the feelings inside your forearms and fingers. Is that me? Does it feel like me? 
go into your chest and ask yourself, is that experience of my chest me? Or am I separate and I am the watcher, the feeler? If it's the latter decision you make, you can ask yourself, where is the watcher? Is he or she in the same dimension as the watched? In the same reality as the watched? Or is it in a different dimension that cannot be watched itself? Can you watch the watcher? You can, but it creates a lot of tension to turn your attention around and watch the watcher. And as the watcher approaches itself, it can get closer and closer. But all of a sudden something happens. And the watcher turns around and looks back at where it came from. And suddenly the external world is there, totally present without any thoughts in your mind. Who's had these kinds of experiences? Does this sound like something you want to do? To know yourself that intimately? So that you can say after a while, I really see that I'm mostly in my everyday life acting as if I were a conscious entity that was living within this body. but which is invisible, it's really just consciousness. And is it consciousness which is sentient? Or is there something that's aware of consciousness that's in a different dimension? Do you think about these things? And this is what you'll have to do at some point. Be very much aware of your consciousness and its changes throughout the day, especially when you wake up in the morning or go to sleep at night or where you suddenly become aware that you've been daydreaming. And when you're aware that you're daydreaming, the daydreaming stops abruptly and you're self-aware for a moment of a mind that's not thinking. What is your experience then? Is it in time or out of time? Or even does that make no sense to say? Remember, in reality, You consider yourself foremost a mind, a thinker, a feeler. But you've had a concept all your life that you're the body. 
But when you begin examining yourself, all that you ever really know is consciousness, including consciousness of the body. But you're also conscious of things that are not the body. So why do you limit your identity to that of the body? When you're really also aware of the moon, the sun, others, houses, trains, airplanes. Are these not you also? How do you allow them to become you? How do you sit in meditation till you're so quiet that you as a body disappear and you then re-identify with the totality of everything? The world is not as you think it to be. The world of concepts that most people live in is an artificial world, a matrix. You put yourself in the matrix in a job, in an office building, when you can really walk outside on the ledge and jump from building to building but your identity with your body and the concept that you are primarily a body keeps you imprisoned. When easily you could move from one consciousness to another consciousness within your own awareness, but instead you allow yourself to imprison yourself in your body. How can you do that to Brahman? For you are the totality of everything. But you choose to identify yourself with name and a body. You know, I've gotten to a place I cannot even write my name because it seems so false to write my name. So I scribble and it's barely recognizable as my, it's not even recognizable as my name. Fortunately, my scribbling all looks alike, so it can still be identified as my scribble, my name. But I can't write my name. I have a resistance to writing the name, so I scribble. because I don't want to narrow myself to an identity like that. Who here has no name? Who here denies your name? Who here renounces your identity with your body? Say, I refuse. Ian, you said that you did that. You're not admitting to it now. No point. Raghu, do you get this? Yeah, did you say Raju? Yeah. 
Did you ask me, Raju? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I always think I was born before my body, uh, before my mind. When I'm in my mother's womb, I existed before anything came to me. So it is a strong conviction for me that I am not the body or I am not the mind. Good. Spencer. Yes. Who are you? I don't know. I'm just experiencing my life. So you're the experiencer of your life? Yeah, I guess you could say that, but it seems like a game. Bernadette. What say you? I think about this stuff all the time. I do not think I am the body, but I feel like I have to deal with it and everything that happens to it. I have to, it gets a toothache. I have to take it to the dentist and it seems annoying. And um, I guess I feel more the feeler, um, but I'm, I'm having some time where I can just be the observer. So I don't know. Good, good for you. Chris. Depends on the day, the minute. Sometimes I'm watching, sometimes I'm feeling, sometimes I'm wrapped up in my mind and being Chris. Sometimes I'm watching me be Chris. It's just all over the place. Ian. Um, um, I can only speak from this moment and this moment uh, when you call in it's I answer to it like a dog answers to a to a command but um, no no I'm not here Mark, what about you? Gee, I was thinking, you say to me, uh, hey, Mark, what about you? Are, 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 do you respond to the name Mark? And I go, no. What gives you that idea? Um, I primarily abide, I love abiding in Turia. I realized recently that that is, your definition of Turia is where I'm in a lot of the time. and. Um, my greatest joy is to abide in and connect with divine energies, which seems to be doing the, the transformation within me, seems to be giving me everything I need. So, so that's where I'm at. Frank? Who the fuck are you? I knew you were going to call on somebody. I knew you were going to call on somebody with that name. Uh, you you were speaking directly to me today, as you have before. I I seem to vacillate between being the that which is aware of being aware, of being lost in the concepts of my mind. And when you said. If you're Brahmin, how could you limit yourself to this? Suddenly I felt the, the uh, 
the pain and the ridiculous nature of this mental struggle that I've been engaged in around this, as you began today, this decision that needs to be made. I also get confused about um, if I'm not the body, and yet you're saying pay attention to the body, but you're really not saying pay attention to the body. You're saying pay attention to being aware of what's happening in the body, but not identify with it. That's what I hear at least. So things are definitely unfolding for me. I've caught that Turia stage that you speak of. I've caught that Turia stage for milliseconds a couple of times in this past week. David, what about you? Who are you? The only essential question, and it's a ludicrous one. Um, I, on an operational level, I just have no idea at all. I mean, I'm just a changing bundle of appearances and disappearances and um, I'm just going with that. I mean, I have the knowledge through a lot of uh, incessant pounding and Vedanta that I am, you know, the nature of truth and being and all of that. Um, Who are you really though on a practical level? Day to day energy. level. Just energy. No, that's Mark's definition. He's a bundle of coherent energy systems or something like that. Just, I'll just go back to the beginning. It's just an experience. Changing experiences. Vesselina, I'll ask you slightly differently. What are you? Uh, I don't know. A plant. A plant? Yeah. What kind of plant? A begonia? <laughs> no, I just told and you the first thing I saw in the room. That's pretty good. I like that. First of all, you said, I don't know, which is a perfect answer. And then a plant, the first thing that comes into your mind, it's pretty good. That's a good Zen answer. Both of them are good Zen answers. A begonia is a new pronunciation. Is a what? <laughs> well, it's, it's begonia, but begonia has, <laughs> I don't know, you're sort of from her part of town all of a sudden. I mean... <laughs> Sounds a little, a little big Bulgarian twist to it. Uh, anyway. I thought it was a New York twist. <laughs> I, I, I no. Uh, well, I don't know. It's like, I, but go on, I, yeah. I only shared that I went out without identification the other day, and I was terrified because I I didn't know who I was. I had come from an atmosphere where people gave me a name. And in the context of, I, since I never knew that I was born or could prove it, I couldn't necessarily prove who I was. And, and it, it left, you know, it was kind of a shock uh, in the, to the extent that I spend in mon mundanity. But it's kind of like the thing from Sesame Street where somebody saw a tree and then some said, what do you call it? And they said a tree and somebody else, else says, well, I call it Shirley. And you know, I, I just think that's that's so perfect. That's so what what Veselina said was exquisite. Just 
absolutely joy. I wish, I wish they said that about me in the medical school too. <laughs> you wish you said that about the medical school or they said that about you? They said it about me. Oh, perfect answer. I don't know. <laughs> They couldn't do that and still call themselves doctors, Vesselini. What, what did you say? They couldn't? They, I said they can't see you in the way you just described and still call themselves doctors. Their frame of vision is much too narrow to see you. I yeah. know that's a generalization, but... No, no, I understand. So to look to be seen in that environment is only going to be a source of frustration and pain. You ought to know he's a doctor. Yeah, I know you said it last time. And I, I figured it. Well, can we have some chanting music? Engaging anywhere from six to 10 minutes of chanting? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 